Welcome to the Scientific Sense podcast, where we explore emerging ideas from science, policy, economics, and technology. My name is Gil Epen. We talk with world's leading academics and experts about their recent research or general areas of topical interest. Scientific Sense is an unstructured conversation with no agenda or preparation. We cover a wide variety of domains where new discoveries are made and new technologies are developed on a daily basis. We are most interested in how new ideas affect society and help educate the world how to pursue a rewarding and enjoyable life rooted in science, logic, and information. We seek knowledge without boundaries or constraints and provide unedited content of conversations with researchers and leaders who love what they do. A companion blog to this podcast can be found at scientificsense.com and this podcast is available on over a dozen platforms and directly at scientificsense.net. If you have suggestions for topics, guests, and other ideas, please send them to info at scientificsense.com and I can be reached at gil at epen.info. My guest today is Professor Fernando Muzio, who is a professor of chemical and biochemical engineering at Rutgers University and the director of the NSF Engineering Research Center on Structured Organic Particulate Systems. Professor Muzio has authored over 250 peer-reviewed papers and numerous book chapters and patents. He is one of the founding co-chairs of the International Institute for Advanced Pharmaceutical Manufacturing. Welcome, Fernando. Hi, thank you. How are you? Good, good. Um, I want to start with, um, you know, the sort of the, the global supply chain for drug substance and drug product manufacturing. Um, I know that my understanding is that um, the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient that goes into tablets and capsules uh, that we have in drug product, uh, a, a good percentage of that is manufactured in China and India today. So I want to get a kind of an overall picture of how that supply chain is working today. Yes, uh, that is actually true. It's, it's uh, the majority, in fact, of drug substances. And uh, for many drug substances, all of the material or a great majority is manufactured overseas. Yeah. Uh, China and India, more China than India, I believe, is uh, the numbers I've seen. Right. Um, and so, you know, basically we do depend on having access to uh, material produced overseas uh, for, you know, to make products. In many cases, the, f- the product itself is actually manufactured overseas and then imported, meaning, you know, the finished tablet, the finished capsule, yeah. the vial is manufactured entirely overseas in many cases. Right, right. So this, from a, from a risk management perspective, uh, could cause a problem, right? That is concentration in, uh, in this critical materials uh, being manufactured in one or two countries if something uh, happens, uh, it, it creates a huge issue for the supply chain, I would imagine. Correct. Yeah, I, I have actually been worried about this for many years. And, uh, and now COVID basically demonstrated that indeed this is a potentially big problem because uh, there could be a number of reasons why the supply chain could be disrupted, uh, ranging from you know, a natural disaster yeah. Uh, to a pandemic, uh, which leads to the discontinuation of activities in many of the factories, right? Uh, there were many companies producing APIs in China that were closed in right. the early stages of the pandemic in China. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, uh, you know, there could be situations where a country decides that they do not want to sell to the U.S. anymore. Right. Or where this has also happened, uh, we become aware that there are quality problems, uh, that there is data being, quality data being falsified, yeah. uh, that could suddenly lead to a need to interrupt the sourcing of a material. Um, 
and then suddenly we don't have access to the raw material needed to make the product. Um, there was a time during the pandemic uh, where uh, India was putting a hold on sales of many ingredients and products mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they they were concerned about their domestic needs. Right. Um, right. So yes, we have a situation where the American public is vulnerable to a disruption of the supply chain. And I think the pandemic has forced our political class to become aware of the enormous potential danger to the American public due to this situation. Yeah, so natural disasters, political risk, uh, and variety of other risks that we haven't even anticipated um, could, could create a problem. Uh, the, the reason the supply chain is in this, in this way today, mm -hmm. I would imagine is the cost differentials, right? The, 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 the need for pharmaceutical companies to reduce the cost of production. Is that what drove a lot of this manufacturing abroad? That's one of the factors, yeah. uh, perhaps the most important, but not the only one. Um, there has been many discussions where, you know, people have explained to me that you can get a factory up and running much faster in other countries because mm -hmm. uh, there are fewer regulatory hurdles. And in some cases, governments of other countries have co-invested in mm -hmm. providing the capital needed to create those facilities, right? They have... Over the last 20 years, uh, China and India actively sought to attract a lot of the pharmaceutical manufacturing activity successfully using a combination of techniques. And so the low cost of labor, the simpler regulatory framework, the faster, uh, the ability to create the systems faster, all of those things together, and the availability of capital, all right. of those combined to create the current situation. Um, aren't these factories, though, they have to be GMP, they have to be FDA inspected, right? They, they have to still maintain the same quality standards as we have today, don't, don't they? Well, um, it, there has been a number of publications recently um, that have actually illuminated the process and the differences in the process between um, making sure that a US-based or a Western world-based factory is inspected and complies versus facilities in other countries. Uh, among other reasons, uh, access to those facilities for unscheduled visits is different. Mm. So that creates a greater level of difficulty in ensuring um, that indeed everything is, is up to compliance. And in addition to that, um, the ability, the enforcement capabilities are different. Um, the potential for data to be falsified is, mm. you know, or, 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 or forged is different. Um, there was very interesting testimony by Janet Woodcock uh, in Congress in October, it's available, publicly available, where uh, Janet indicated that um, there is limited knowledge about exactly where the ingredients are manufactured. Mm. Yeah. So I think that it's much easier for the regulators to ensure the compliance uh, in facilities that are based in the U.S. or in Europe. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a complex process, um, the pharmaceutical manufacturing. And so the you know the the quality and the standardization of starting materials uh, and the intermediates they all affect ultimately the impurities that that might be present in the end product right yes and yeah. so so you had a testimony uh, to the Congress recently and I think you brought up some of these these factors from a risk perspective what was the general response from the Congress. Uh, it was very interesting. And again, the, <laughs> the, the proceeding is available, right? To me, yeah. what was very striking was that the, the kind of questions that I was getting from Democrats and Republicans was very similar. Mm. Um, and without getting into politics, right, that wasn't usually the case. In the past, they tend to focus on different aspects. Uh, this time, Maybe because the day I provided my testimony was the same day that Congress was being briefed on the pandemic. 
right uh, this was late january right um but the i would think the members of congress that were in the panel and there were in the in the subcommittee and there were quite a few actually i think that there were more than 20 of them there mm. um were all very concerned very concerned about uh this uh fragility of the supply chain this vulnerability to imports this uh, we have been under shortages of a number of drugs for years. The shortages got worse in the last few months. Um, and overall, how do we reverse the situation? What can we do to uh, regrow domestic manufacturing of uh, ingredients and finished products? That was where I think most of the questions were, were focused. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one of the areas that you have been focused on for over 50 years is is sort of a paradigm change in manufacturing. So typically products are manufactured in batches and uh, it has a heavy human resource component to it. And that's one of the reasons um, production or manufacturing is pushed to low cost countries. And and you have been uh, working on the, the, the paradigm uh, sometimes called continuous manufacturing when I was at Pfizer in the 90s, uh, late 90s, uh, we were experimenting with the same. Uh, we used to call it flow chemistry. Is it basically the same ideas? No, actually, no. it's not quite this. I mean, flow chemistry is a kind of continuous manufacturing. So that's where the difference is. So what you are talking about is the application of continuous manufacturing for the synthesis and the purification of the active ingredient. And that can be implemented using flow chemistry, which is basically, you know, you essentially have your manufacturing system is just for simplification's sake, a very long pipe yeah. and the reaction is happening in some parts of the pipe. And then there is filtration or chromatography happening in other parts of the pipe. Eventually you are crystallizing and you deliver your pure crystals at the end of this mythical pipe right mm. so that that was that's for liquids and that process that kind of continuous processing of fine chemicals in liquid phase was originally initiated by the petrochemical industry at the industrial scale right yeah um i mean it's older than that we have been doing continuous flow for water purification mm. for about three centuries right um and so it's, it's the idea of using continuous flow of liquids um, for large volume production is not new. Uh, pharma adopted it from the fine chemicals industry uh, sometime around the 60s and 70s. Yeah. And it's been growing ever since. And it is one of the successful types of continuous manufacturing. We started working around, I would say, 1990 or thereabouts. Yeah on implementing the continuous flow of powders hmm. for the manufacturing of finished products, tablets, capsules, etc. Yeah. And um, around 2004, 2005, things really got interesting. The funding started coming in. The NSF, the National Science Foundation, became interested. Then the Food and Drug Administration, more recently the United States Pharmacopoeia. I mean, they've all been uh, increasingly um, joining the effort. Uh, so, but what we did is we created continuous flow of solid materials yeah. that require us to redesign the, the processes that we use to, to, to process the powders and to create many sensing uh, tools so that we could register the quality of the material as it's being processed. And then we had to create a control infrastructure, software and models, etc., that allow us to control the process. Right. in real time so that we can monitor and control the quality of the product as we are producing it. And that's the main advantage of continuous manufacturing. It's automated and it allows you to do real-time control of quality. Okay, so so what are the major differences then, Fernando? So so this is, um, I would imagine this is a, the equipment that you need to use is of smaller footprint here, right? And For sure. And it's much more automated, perhaps, so less a human resource intervention is needed? Yes. In your typical batch process, you have steps that are done in sequence, right? So yeah. they will dispense the entire batch of materials onto a pallet, right? And it could be 500 kilos of powder. Mm -hmm. And then the, those 500 kilos will be loaded onto a big bucket, 
and will be mixed for a certain amount of time. And now you have a 500 kilo batch of blended powder, but you need to make sure it's uniform. Yeah. So the way you would do that today is they would go with a sampling tool, which looks like a sphere, and they would get a few samples from a few spots out of these 500 kilos of powder. And then they would have to wait a few days until they get the results of the analysis, or they would have to proceed at risk and say, okay, let's hope it's homogeneous. Then they would then start processing the material. They would load it onto a granulator and turn the powder into granules, or they would um, you know, do several other ways to process the material, blend it some more in another bucket after granulation, add other ingredients. Uh, if the granulation method involves liquids, you have to dry the material. Each step could take a day or two. Then it's transferred to intermediate containers. The powder can segregate. Uh, you have to bring it back. And then finally you go into turning it into tablets. By the time you are done, mm -hmm. You have spent weeks, perhaps, uh, with the same material. Yeah. And your assessment of quality is based on those few samples that you can take here and there. And mm. so, for example, you made a million tablets and you sampled 30. Yeah? Yeah. And you assume that those 30 represent the entire batch so that you can then, depending on the results you get for those 30 tablets, you decide to release or not to release the whole million tablets to the market. That's the batch process. And so yeah. there is a there is sort of a quality risk there that if if you are uh, if at the end of that process of that million tablets, uh, the sample that you are testing um, is not meeting the criteria, then you have to reject the entire entire batch. Then correct. Right? So the whole batch is at risk, which causes expenditures, cost, and also delays. Right. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, you also have the opposite situation where maybe the 10 or 20 or 30 tablets you sampled are okay and mm -hmm. you release the batch only to discover weeks or months later that there was a problem that you didn't detect and now you have to recall the batch. <laughs> right, right. And Even more expensive. Many times too. So, you know, yeah. both are issues. Right. So in the continuous manufacturing then, in some, some way, could we think about this as sort of a small batches small, uh, going through the process? You can, but the batches are very small. The batches yeah. might be as small as just one tablet. That might be your batch. I mean, <laughs> okay. this is, what you have is one machine, Yeah. the size of a room, the size of, you know, I am sitting in my office and I can, I could actually fit the entire system in my office. And the powder comes in through one end and the finished product comes out through the other end. And as the powder travels through yeah. my room size, factory, it is transformed into the finished product, right? But I never have 500 kilos of powder in my line. I have mm -hmm. two or three kilos at a time, right? Right. And I'm monitoring how that material is becoming product, and I'm monitoring the quality of what I'm doing. And if when I am making it, if I measure something that is problematic, I can modify my process so that I can correct and I can immediately go back to making product of the right quality. So I don't risk a whole batch yeah. on the one hand. And on the other hand, I don't measure 30 tablets. I measure 30,000 or 100,000 or the whole million tablets. <laughs> Depends <laughs> on the techniques I'm using to measure, but I have the ability to monitor my process very closely. Right. So from an R&D perspective, this clearly has a, a big advantage in clinical clinical programs where, you know, you're not looking for million um, million tablets as, as it's in production. So can you actually deploy this in, a, you know, in clinical um, clinical batches? You can, uh, but you have to you have to be very, you know, careful about what you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the main advantage for a clinical situation of this technology is that if you wanted to make 20 different versions of the same product, having 20 different compositions, like for example, if you are developing a product that involves two or more drugs yeah. and you wanted to make, you know, half a dozen different versions of the same product, right. you can do that very quickly with this technology because let's say that I'm making product that has the same amount of two APIs. And now I want to double the amount of one of the APIs. I can simply change the settings of 
my feeders. So now I begin to feed my system the new ratio. Right. And five minutes later, the tablets coming out of my system have this new ratio of the ingredients, right? Mm -hmm. And if I now want to have three to one or four to one, again, five or 10 minutes later, I could be making product like that. So the system gives me the ability to manipulate the product composition and to get uh, versions of the product made very quickly. By the same token, the system also allows me to investigate the many different conditions under which I can make the product very quickly. So one yeah. of the biggest advantages here is that if I have to develop a process and optimize my composition, I can do those two things at the same time, typically in one day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in batch, it would take me months to do the equivalent right. amount of work. Right, right. Yeah, so the change over time and things like that uh, can be substantially lower in this case. The, the response, the time the system takes to respond to a change in a process parameter or a, or a change in composition is very short. Yeah. Compared exactly. to the time it takes to make an, an entire new batch with the new composition. So is this typically done, uh, Fernando, is this typically done today in, uh, in clinical batches? For, well, so in, in product and process development, right? I want to distinguish from the manufacturing of clinical supplies, yeah. which is a different issue, right? This could mean, so in process development, right? Which is typically done during phase three mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the clinical development, right? For phase three clinical trials, you are, yeah. is when you basically do your uh, finish formulation and process development, right? Yeah. Um, in continuous manufacturing, you can use a continuous line to do and look, what we call a, a, a DOE, a set of designed experiments, mm -hmm. in a day or two. And yes, companies are actually doing this very quickly these days. There okay. are companies that can do it. And uh, in the market, in, in production batches, uh, are there any constraints as to, uh, I would imagine there is an optimum quantity right, where this uh, continuous manufacturing would be dominant to batch, but if, if, the, if the numbers are very high, would it then exclude continuous uh, modality as a... As a no, it's the opposite. The more product oh. you make, yeah. the better it is for continuous manufacturing. Oh, okay. The problem with the profitability of the continuous process is when the, the amount of product is small. If you have to make very small amount of product overall, yeah. right, if you're making only one batch per year, probably a continuous line is not going to be the best solution because you have to spend a fair amount of time creating the process that will work mm -hmm. then to only make a small amount of product. But uh, if you have large amounts of product, it's when it's obviously most profitable. Uh, but the equation is changing because there is a tendency now, there is a trend towards building smaller systems. Yeah that can run for longer times, making smaller amounts of product per hour. And that makes continuous systems um, competitive in scales of production that 10 years ago we wouldn't have expected. Right. right. And, the, and the capital investment uh, yeah. into a continuous manufacturing line, is that, is that higher? No, it's not. If you're starting from scratch and you have to build a factory, um, you're not going to spend more money in a continuous line than in a batch line. What you do have to put more effort is into uh, the level of know-how that you mm -hmm. uh, acquire. I mean, continuous systems are knowledge intensive. That's the main issue, really, uh, mm -hmm. with companies implementing continuous systems is that uh, many companies don't have the know-how. And I talk to those companies every week. Um, yeah. That you know, okay, we don't have all the necessary knowledge. How do we, how do we figure out what to do here? And uh, you know, it's it, right now that is the very limiting step is the access to know-how. Yeah, so it's interesting. So the the labor cost would be lower from a production perspective, but you do need certain specific expertise for this to work, right? Certain skills yes. that need to come together for it to yes. work. Yeah. And and a lot of it is actually, it sounds, you know, it's very different skills, um, yes. seems to me. So there is system dynamics, there are sensors, there are controls. Yes. Um, and so it's not just chemistry, but it's also all the all the components of 
um, other other components that need to come together. Yes. Um, and so, so would you say then, you know, clearly a, a, a large pharmaceutical company can can do this. They are already doing it. Uh, would it would that requirement in terms of skills needed to actually get into it? Uh, does does that preclude sort of the the, the smaller and the medium sized companies from doing this? It doesn't preclude them because the cost of acquiring this skill set is small compared to the total amount of money they spend on payroll, right? Yeah. But there is a knowledge gap and there is a cultural gap in the sense that, you know, it's hard for a manager to hire a certain person if the manager herself or himself doesn't have full visibility on, you know, what that knowledge needs to be. You know, you need basically vertical integration of know-how in the corporation, right? Mm -hmm. You need managers that also understand what we're talking about, not just, uh, you know, the people that they will hire. So, but, you know, but on the other hand, there is an enormous level of interest and enthusiasm right now. Yeah. Uh, in the last six months, I have noticed a significant change in how many generic companies are showing keen interest in these and also you know, groups that work on over-the-counter products are, are getting into this. So I think if we really want to transform the manufacturing landscape, mm -hmm. what we need to do as a system and as a country is we have to figure how do we make the know-how available and accessible to a much larger set of players? What kind of vehicles can we create that allow these companies to find the expertise that they need? So wouldn't, uh, Fernando, wouldn't the contract manufacturing organizations uh, see this gap and step in and really specialize in this area? Or has that not happened yet? That has happened. That okay. is happening. I mean, there are uh, already two contract manufacturing organizations in the U.S., or maybe there is a third one as well, mm -hmm. uh, that are already implementing systems, uh, that have already implemented systems, uh, uh, at least one of those is available for companies to go and uh, and work. This is a solution to a part of the issue. It's not the full solution because mm -hmm. the contract manufacturer can become very good at doing this, uh, but then the client is limited to manufacturing at the contract manufacturer site. Yeah. So this doesn't really solve the issue for companies that want to operate their own manufacturing processes. Right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, if you have a fully vertically integrated pharmaceutical company, then this is something, this becomes sort of core core part of your operation. So you can really rely on an outsourced partner to provide this. Correct. And in addition to that, I would argue that even if we eventually evolve into an industry where a half a dozen contract manufacturers are the main reservoir of expertise and they basically develop products and manufacture products for everybody else, which is one possible way this could evolve. Yeah. Um, I would still be very concerned about the owner of the um, application, right? The, the company, the pharmaceutical company that owns the product, they need to understand the manufacturing process too. Mm -hmm. And they need to understand how their materials interact with the process to create the product. And at the end of the day, they need to understand the product. Right. So um, no, you cannot completely uh, divorce yourself from product and process development and, and process understanding. They, they still need to acquire enough knowledge about how the process is developed and operated so that they can be responsible for uh, what their product, how their product behaves, right? Right, right, yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, I want to get your insights into this. So as, as we go forward, I would imagine there will be more automation, more robotics, yes. uh, perhaps even, you know, some artificial intelligence related techniques that could pick up impurities a lot earlier that could all be integrated into this process. Mm -hmm. So the process could move more into, correct me if I'm wrong, more into computing yeah. and, uh, and robotics which is a little bit away from a typical pharmaceutical company's core capabilities, right? Exactly. And it's happening already. Mm. And basically, you put your finger on uh, um, uh, maybe a more um, evolved situation than it's 
the is currently the case, but we're already in that transition, right? I mean, there is already a significant level of process integration and process automation needed mm. and it's growing because, you know, it started with the mechanical integration of equipment. Then it was a matter of including sensors for process surveillance. Now we are talking about real time quality assurance and real time quality control. The next thing is going to be the full integration of the manufacturing platform into the enterprise wide, uh, you know, management software, right? The software that runs the whole place. Not yeah. just design. And later on that, we're going to be talking about how do we use the big data generated by the manufacturing process to learn more or to have systems that optimize themselves in real time. Right. And it's an evolution, right? It's an evolution that other industries have followed and it's an evolution that pharma will follow too, because the, the benefits are very large because the cost savings are very substantial and because it leads to a better understanding of the technology and better quality of the product. So yes, that's the direction we're going. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know, I mean, uh, I don't know if it's possible or it might be way down the, down the road. This is very amenable to uh, personalized medicine, right? So if, if we say, you know, every tablet could have a, a different dose or a different yeah. uh, modality. Uh, it's something that this type of a process could handle. Well, um, you're talking about something very dear to my heart. So let me tell you. Yeah. No, continuous manufacturing is probably not going to be the tool that will enable personalized medicine. Okay, okay. Because, again, because it's a technology that is best suited for making relatively large number of product units all with very, very well controlled quality. Mm. What we have, and our center has worked on this too, and we have a number of platforms that we worked on, yeah. is what you have is the micro dispensing or the micro manufacturing methods. Mm. What you have is a robotic uh, platform that is able to make individual tablets or individual capsules or individual vials, right? Right. And the technology to do that also exists. What's really interesting is that the building blocks for automating and controlling quality in the microfabrication platform are the same yeah. as the building blocks that you use in the continuous application. Right. They are used in a slightly different way, right? Right. You are still assuring the quality of every product unit, and you are actually in the microfabrication, you are using micro dispensing methods to control the composition of each product unit. Right. And that was going to lead us to the personalization of, of the dosing. Right, right. Um, I want to quickly touch on a few of your recent papers also, uh, Fernando. Mm -hmm. so, so one of them is entitled Modeling the Effects of Material Properties on Tablet Compaction. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that um, in the context of continuous uh, manufacturing process? Yes, we have, we have put out a, a number of publications where we have tried to focus on understanding the relationship between ingredient material properties and blend material properties or, and product attributes, right? Mm -hmm. And so everybody knows in the industry, and it's, it's just a matter of logic, that the properties of the ingredients, as they interact with the process, are going to control the attributes of the product, right? right? The linkage between ingredients, process, and product is the microstructure that you create. That's why this, the name of our center is Structured Organic Particulate Systems. Mm -hmm. When these ingredients come together in a process, we form structures with a certain architecture, and that architecture controls how the product behaves. For example, at what rate is the drug substance going to be released into the body? very quickly, very slowly, or in between, depends on the architecture I create when I put the ingredients together. Mm. Which ingredient is touching which ingredient? What is the relative surface area of contact? Uh, you know, what are the attributes of the different ingredients that the, that the body will react to as the product is ingested, right? So yeah. um, we decided that uh, it was time to build a predictive material property database where we would actually compile the material properties that are relevant to the process by a large number of potential ingredients mm. 
And then we started creating models that would predict how the ingredients would behave in the process and also what the properties of the blends and the finished product would be yeah. based on the properties of the ingredients and the measured performance of those ingredients. We're fairly far along. I mean, for a particular pro process, continuous direct compression, which is the simplest and, and easiest to implement process, we have already created uh, model libraries that allow us to basically select ingredients and specify the process very quickly. Yeah, so right. we can screen whether a given formulation is suitable for manufacturing in just a few days. We can optimize a formulation in a couple of weeks. And in that, for that particular process, we have been able to create a functional process in less than a month for a given, you know, from zero, from start to finish. Okay. And this is, you know, this is a very significant, uh, I would say, uh, rate of progress in, in doing this kind of work. So, so um, simplistically, Fernando, so if, if, if you have the characteristics that you need for a tablet, um, you, could, you could basically say what, what characteristics you need in the materials yeah. for that to happen, right? Yeah. If I know I need a certain hardness, if I know that I have a certain amount of drug substance, yeah. if I know that I need a certain drug release profile, we can first do a preliminary selection of ingredient candidates that would be most suitable. We would then test the properties of those ingredients and we would compare, uh, we would use those results from material properties of ingredients together with our models to predict if those ingredients will work well in the process. If necessary, we would replace those ingredients with similar ingredients with slightly different properties. Um, we would do some few verification experiments on tabletop tests yeah. that we would do with very small amounts of materials. And in a matter of days, we would be able to arrive at a formulation that would work for that mm -hmm. product. Mm -hmm. Another paper you have um, entitled Methods and Tools for Design Space Identification in Pharmaceutical oh. Development. So what's a design space? So the design space is, a, is language used by the FDA uh, mainly in the context of quality by design. Yeah. Basically, when you figure that certain values of parameters of the process, certain, let's say the, the speed of the mixer and the compression force in the tablet press, right? there is a range on the values of those parameters that will assure that you will produce product of acceptable quality. Mm -hmm. So that range of these process parameters is called the design space. And the regulation is that as long as you are within that design space mm -hmm. and you have shown that you can make acceptable product quality within that range, you can change the values of the parameters as long as you stay within the four corners of your design space to make product. Mm -hmm. So that the tools that you, you have or created uh, is sort of optimizing within that design space, or what? what our, are, yeah. our team has created a series of modeling tools that mm -hmm. allows us to very quickly explore the parametric space yeah. and to find within the parametric space to find the design space. Uh, the person leading that effort in our team is a colleague of mine, Professor Marianti Ira Petritu, who uh, recently moved from Rutgers to Delaware. Uh, she was the lead person in, in uh, doing that modeling and, and uh, implementing those methods for the rapid characterization of the design space. Okay. The other thing that is important in this context is that a continuous process runs in a state of control. Mm -hmm. So in essence, you have the ability not only to assure that your system is within the design space, you have the ability to continuously move your system towards the optimum location in the design space. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to steer your process so that not only you are making acceptable quality, that, but also that you're making the best possible product. Right. Quality. right. Yeah. And probably least cost. It will, yeah, no, I mean, the, this doesn't have an impact on cost. Yeah. yeah. Once you have implemented your system, 
your system is more capable, <laughs> but it doesn't add to the cost to operate the process to have these these methodologies once you have put them in place. Right. Yeah. So, so in conclusion, Fernando, you know, so if you look forward next five years in the continuous manufacturing space in pharmaceuticals, um, where do you think the biggest um, innovation will happen? Uh, there is so much happening. I, I, I can envision many things happening. Uh, you know, I, I hope that what we can see is that we make it possible for many more companies to adopt the technology. I think that as a country, we should create the vehicles that give these companies access to the science and technology mm -hmm. so that they can implement it. And that would actually cause a major uh, revolution in the level of knowledge that we can use to create process and products. Another very exciting development that I look forward to is that people are beginning to implement these methods in the biomanufacturing oh, area right? yeah. for large molecules. Mm -hmm. In the next five years, we should get to the point where we can design and operate those processes uh, more or less at the same level of capability that we do today for solid dose products. And that would be a very significant development that could significantly lower the cost mm -hmm. of the biomolecules, which right now is a big contributing factor to how expensive those products are. Right. Uh, I also think that we're going to see applications in other areas. One of the most exciting areas right now is the implementation of these methods for sterile injectable products. Mm. And that's important because, uh, you know, many of the products in shortage right now, many of the products that we need to fight COVID are mm. sterile injectable products. So being able to create efficient platforms for manufacturing those products would be extremely important. Another thing I hope happens is that we actually use all of this technology to very significantly accelerate the time frame of developing new products. Mm -hmm. If we can create methods to develop new products in weeks rather than years, if right. we could actually improve the clinical trial process so that it's also much faster, um, right. we will have better tools to fight the next pandemic. Mm -hmm. Right now, we are in a situation where it takes months and months and months to do it. Yeah, and and if you're successful to to broadly apply this, then manufacturing becomes more distributed, and that sort of you know reduces the 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 supply chain risk that we talked about, also, right? Yeah, if we actually can implement these platforms at smaller scales, we could have many more systems in many more places, right? And that would actually be very. I mean, we could actually recreate domestic manufacturing using more advanced technology. So the industry will be more competitive. Yeah. The industry will be more capable. I mean, I think we need to reveal the manufacturing capabilities of the pharmaceutical industry, but the way I would put it is that I want to build the industry of the 1930s, sorry, the, of the 2030s <laughs> yeah. and the 2040s, not the industry of the 1930s. That's yeah. right. right. I want to build the industry of the future, not recreate the industry of the past. Right. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This has been great, Fernando. Thanks so much for spending time with me. My and, pleasure. And uh, good luck with uh, all the work that you're doing in continuous manufacturing. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Sure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.